Proverbs chapter 1, the first nine verses, let's read responsively, all together on verse 1 and every other verse, down through verse 9 tonight, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, again, for just, Lord, these words out of Proverbs that we've read tonight. And thank you for your word. Please teach us. Help us, Lord, to understand. Help us, Lord, to, Lord, just to love you more. Lord, preach you with your spirit as he preaches tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. It is impossible to believe that we have been nearly a half a year in lessons from Proverbs. In fact, we've had 25 different studies in this particular thing, and I'm excited about it because we're not done yet, but I thought it would be wise, it'd be very prudent, because we've done all this teaching for all these weeks, 25 weeks, and not one time have we explained what a proverb is. And I th told you that I would probably do that. Well, this is gonna be the night that I do that, where we learn what a proverb is. And so answering the question, if you're taking notes and putting things down, a Bible study this evening is simply entitled, What is a Proverb? And through it all, we have never defined just what a proverb is because Proverbs 1 is a foundational chapter for understanding and studying the entire book. It is a foundation and has been the foundation of the 25 studies that we have already had. But what is a proverb? So, again, I thought it would be prudent uh, to uh, start at the beginning and uh, define what we have been studying, which are the Proverbs. So what are they? And I have a number of points that I want to share with you tonight, multiple points. Uh, none of them very long, but all of them very pertinent to our studies that we have had and to our study tonight. So, number one, if you're writing things down, what does the word proverb actually mean? What does the word proverb actually mean? The Hebrew word for proverb is the word mishlai, M-I-S-H-L-A-I, mishlai. That's important to know. It comes from the word mishal, M-A-S-H-A-L. That's how we would spell it in our English language. So mishal, which is M-I-S-H-L-A-I, mishlai, and it comes from the word mishal, which is M-A-S-H-A-L, which means this. Write it down. It means to rule. R-U-L-E. It means to rule. And so Proverbs are words given to us to rule or govern our lives, which is what we must understand. And I remember years and years ago first studying this, and we're talking now Oh, goodness, well over 20 years ago, learning that uh, the word rule and governor is so very, very important. And as I saw the word governor, governor, I was overtaken by surprise, realizing that that's what it means. And so these are not just a collection of bits of human wisdom. Uh, and it's not that they are not connected, which many people think they're just a number of sayings that are disconnected one from the other, but they are not. They are connected very much so. It's a collection, though, not of man's wisdom, but a collection of God's wisdom from heaven, the rules that God gives us from heaven for earth, us down here. We need these, you see. When you have no rule, you have anarchy. Many years ago, I taught a Bible class, and we were looking at the Word of God there in First and Second Samuel, where the Bible talked about, uh, and even in the book of Joshua and other places where there was no rule, and every man that did that which was right in their own eyes. And as I studied that word, that's called anarchy. God did not leave us to live an anarchist life. 
He left us with rules or governors, things to govern our lives so that we can live the way that God wants us to. And every single one of us, all of us need a governor in our lives. Doesn't matter who we are. Uh, someone might say, well, I'm just an independent. Well, I'm glad that you are, but you need a governor. You need something that will rule over you, that will teach you right from wrong. And without a governor, your life will become haphazard. It will become erratic. And maybe the worst thing about it is it will become impulsive. You just do what you do when you do it with no regard for anything else. That governor is what keeps us in line. And a governor keeps you from losing control. And every time a person loses control, it is because they have forsaken their governor. I want to say it again. You see, a governor keeps us from going out of control. And every time a person loses control, uh, they blame it on being German, they blame it on being French, they blame it on being a redhead, they blame it on the dog, they blame it on the cat, they blame it on their husband, they blame it on their wife, they blame it on their children. But the bottom line is they're out of control because they don't have a governor or they have forsaken the governor that God has given them. So first of all, the word proverb uh, means a rule or a governor in our lives. Now, when I was growing up, uh, my brother built go-karts and not go-karts so much as it was mini bikes. They get that little Tecumseh engine off of a lawnmower and put it onto a metal frame and all the rest of it. And uh, it, to give it gas and make it go faster, it had a little thing on it called a governor. That little cable that goes from the throttle all the way down to the engine, it had a little knot of steel that was welded onto the cable and you couldn't go any faster because it had a governor on it, you see. And many vehicles today are the same way. You buy a certain kind of a bus or a certain kind of a transport vehicle, they won't go faster than a certain mile an hour. That happens because they have a governor on the engine. They don't want the engine burning up and going out of control. So number one, what it really means, a rule or a governor. Number two, Proverbs is scripture. We have to understand that Proverbs is not just a collection of man's wisdom. I already said that. It is God's word and it is scripture. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, the word of God says all scripture, and that includes Proverbs. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the next verse says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished. What does it mean perfect? Sinless? No. It means that he may grow up and actually be mature. So that means that Proverbs was given to us to help us to be perfect, not sinless, but to be mature. That book of Proverbs is there for that purpose. And because it is scripture, understand this, it is inspired of God. And what that means is, is God breathed out the words and into the writers of, of our Bible. And God's words were then given in that way, inspired, breathed out, and then breathed in. There was no room for human error in inspiration because God gave every word. Every word of God is pure, the Bible says, purified seven times in a furnace of silver. And it's the word of God, and it's the every word that is there is the word of God. It's not like the American Bible Society said, every, all scripture, that all that is scripture is inspired of God. That's how they changed it in their little translation. No, in other words, they were teaching that not everything in the Bible is inspired. Some of it is not. They'll take a verse like, uh, well, many Christians today, where Paul will say, uh, I give this not by commandment. And they think that that means Paul was simply writing in his own words. No, he's simply saying this. God hadn't written this down before. This is new material that God has given us by inspiration. And Paul said that, I believe, twice in his writings. And God gave him new teachings that we needed. Now, it is scripture. God breathed every single word of it. And even though Solomon and others are the human instruments, God chose the pen uh, to pen the Proverbs. Every verse is, is God breathed. We have to understand that. And I believe that's true. These verses are not Solomon's. 
or anyone else's personal opinions. They are God's very words, and therefore they are Solomon's opinions and the writers of the different writers that are found here. But it wasn't Solomon writing down what he thought. He was writing down what God thought, which of course matched what Solomon believed. And we must remember that these Proverbs are God-breathed, and therefore they're not simply the ramblings of man. And man can ramble, but God never did. The truth of the matter is God never said a word that he didn't mean and didn't he meant every word that he said. And every word in your Bibles are there on purpose and with purpose. God made no mistakes. He was not trying to fill space with extra words. That's what we do. When somebody gets an assignment in school or in college and they have to write a paper and it has to have 5,000 words, you're thinking you could cover that subject in a single page. So you start adding words and you get more prolific and you might change this or give it, uh, you might uh, start adding different sentences to explain what you're trying to say. God didn't do that. Every word in the Bible is there on purpose and with purpose and you can trust it because the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration. All scripture is given by God breathing it out and into the writers of our sacred books, the word of God. Thirdly, if you're writing down things. Solomon was teaching his son, Rehoboam. In most of the new translations of the Bible, if I can use that word, when the phrase, my son, is used, they say that means my student. I'm not going to argue with that, but it means my son, and his son was his student. And so, therefore, we have to understand he was teaching his boy. His boy didn't listen very well. But he was teaching his boy Rehoboam. And uh, the words, my son, is mentioned 23 times in the book of Proverbs. 23 times he says, boy, listen up. I'm talking to you, boy. Listen up. And it's exactly what he did. So what I want to do is I want to give you eight of these verses. And on your own, you can do a Bible study. You can go through the book of Proverbs and find all 23 references to my son. I will give you eight of them. They're probably also in the center reference column of your Bible or a chain reference that you could do. And even in the Schofield Bible, there are chain references that are there to go from one place to another. But I would challenge you to sit down one day and find every place in Proverbs where my son is used and realize that dad is teaching his son. First of all, Proverbs 1.8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 1.10 My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. <clears throat> I love the story behind this verse. We gave this to our son Jack as his life verse while he was still in the bassinet, or not bassinet, in the incubator, That's what the agitator. That's what I like to call it. And uh, I had gone to hear Brother Hiles preach and I asked, I told him about our son, and I, uh, I went to the platform and I asked him to sign my Bible. When Brother Hiles signed the Bible, he always signed it, Jack Hiles, Daniel 12, 3. That, that's, and if you've got a Bible that's signed by Jack Hiles, it is signed by Jack Hiles, Daniel 12, 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So I figured that's what was going to happen. And I took my son's, uh, his little um, uh, card that was in his uh, incubator that he was in, has his name on it, and I wanted Brother Hiles to sign that. He did something I'd never seen him do before. He took that card and turned his back to this crowd and to me, and he started to write. And he stood there and thought for a moment, and he signed his name, and then he put down Proverbs 1.10. He looked at me when he turned around and says, you make this his life verse. And I said, yes, sir. What I didn't realize is that's Brother Hiles' life verse, Proverbs 1.10. It's written out. I mean, that's it, his testimony, Proverbs 1.10. He signed Daniel 12.3 because of the soul winning emphasis. He signed his life verse, which I had never seen him do, put down Proverbs 1.10. So when Jack was little and growing up, we talked to him about Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1. 
My son, forget not thy, my, my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 19 and verse 27. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. Boy, hardly a wiser saying has ever been said. That one right there. Let me read it to you again. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. You know where a lot of Christians get in trouble today? They listen to the wrong teachers. They do. And, I, and I'm thinking through that about all the different teachers that are out there today, and some of them have something good to say, but what made them become the liberal that they have become? And he said, don't listen to those words. He says, those are not the words you need to hear. They will cause you to walk away from the truth, and you'll end up leaning toward error. Wow, what a wise saying. That thought has probably not crossed very many Christians' minds, just to really be honest with you. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Was Solomon a very wise father? At one point he was. He wanted his son to learn from him. His son refused to learn from him. Proverbs 24 and verse 21, the last one I'll give you on this, my son, fear thou the Lord and the king and meddle not with them that are given to change. You ought to look at that little word meddle. When I was a Cub Scout, we made baskets, basket weaving. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever done basket weaving, but I did basket weaving when I was a Cub Scout. And uh, my mom kept our, my, and my brother's baskets for a long time. But we did what this verse is talking about, the word metal. It literally means to weave. Don't weave your life with those that are given to change. Don't weave your life in and out of their lives and get caught up with them, you see. You won't like the end product or you'll end up liking it too much and changing what you have always been and should remain. So number one, what does the word proverb mean? Number two, Proverbs is scripture. Number three, Solomon was teaching his son Rehoboam. Number four, there is a declared purpose for the book of Proverbs. You don't have to make this stuff up. Now, I know Brother Penn over the years have joked around. He just says, preacher makes it up as he goes. And he's the one that does that, not me. You see, we have to understand that. However, I do want to say that you don't have to make up a purpose for the book of Proverbs because it's stated. I'm going to give you that. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. As Brother Penn read this to us at the beginning of the Bible study, listen to it again with that thought in mind about a declared purpose for the book. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtly to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Let me give you these in other words. The declared purpose of the book of Proverbs. Number one was to know wisdom. What is wisdom? That is perceptive judgment. That's in verse two. Perceptive judgment. You know, you can have knowledge and no wisdom. And this is talking here about being able to make a wise judgment, a perceptive in judgment, you see. Number two, to know instruction, verse two. And instructions here is talking about teaching, correcting, and reforming an individual's life. To teach, to instruct, and to reform. In other words, forming our lives by the very things that we read, hear, and learn. And all, nobody is a self-made individual. We all have our lives formed from something. Proverbs was given in order to form a person's life. What is the goal of every Christian or should be? To become Christ-like. The only place you're going to find it is in the Bible. 
Ah, let's see here. Number three, to perceive the words of understanding. That little word perceive, you might want to write it in your Bible. It's in verse two there. It means to distinguish, to distinguish the words of understanding. In other words, there's a misunderstanding that comes from some words, and there's an understanding that comes from some words, and the Proverbs was given to us that we might be able to distinguish between the two. Next one to receive instruction of wisdom. That's in verse three. Instruction, someone, you know, the Bible tells us in James, I'm, I'll probably mention this in a little bit, but in James it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Why? Because God gives us wisdom. And what kind of wisdom is there? According to the Bible, there's only two kinds of wisdom. There's wisdom that comes from above, that's heavenly wisdom. And there's wisdom that comes from beneath. That's devilish or worldly or hellish wisdom that they have, you see. And so he tells us that we need to learn how to distinguish these things and to have that instruction of, uh, of wisdom. The next is this, to receive instruction of justice. What is justice? That's the doing of right. What did the prophet write? He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do what? To do justly. I said this on Sunday. God's greatest characteristic is not his love, though God is love. His greatest characteristic is not his judgment, though God is a God of judgment. His greatest characteristic is that of justness, you see. In other words, God is not fair. God is just. The next thing is to receive instruction of judgment. What does that mean? To be able to make a right judgment. Let's see, we have lots of wisdom going out there today that comes off the television, comes out of books and magazines and newspapers, and God forbid off the newscasts and all the stuff on the television that we hear and read and all the rest of it. But you know, to make a right judgment is very, very important. And to make a right judgment, you have to be perceptive. You see, I like how Jesus dealt with questions that were given to him. <laughs> my father will give me my part of the, uh, of the inheritance. And Jesus, what did he do? He looked at him and said, beware of covetousness. He saw through the boy's question and he gave him the right answer, which was, you got a covetous heart. And I'm sure he didn't like to hear that. Okay, to rightly judge. The next one, to receive instruction of equity. That's straightness. Equity, honesty, straightness in a person's life. And that, of course, is verse 3. Next, to give subtlety to the simple. What does the word subtlety mean here? I love the meaning of it. It simply means wise thinking. This is where you're not impulsive. You have wise thinking. You think through things, you see. You don't make impulsive decisions, and you don't give impulsive counsel. Next one is this, to give knowledge and discretion to the young, to the young man. That's verse 4 as well. What is discretion here? This is interesting. That God gives us these two words in a row here, to give knowledge and discretion to the young man, to give him a purpose in his life. What do the young people say when I was growing up? They're always trying to find themselves. They, they didn't know what they wanted. What are you going to do with your life? I don't know. This was to give them that purpose in life. And we studied that from Isaiah 43 and verse 7, that God created us, as well as Israel, to gave us uh, these things. Why? That we might bring glory to God. And whatsoever, whether, whatsoever therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I quoted that wrong. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You see, and whether we be alive or, or dead or whatever it was, we want our lives to bring glory and honor to the Lord. And that is the wise thinking. And that is the purpose to a young man. Next one was to understand a proverb with the proper interpretation. No, you can make up a lot of stuff as you go in the Bible if you don't have understanding. That's where you got to be careful because if you don't have understanding, you'll teach a bad doctrine. And lastly, he said to understand the words of the wise, verse 6. 
to understand the words of the wise. And so that's why Proverbs were given. It gives us direction on how to do every single one of those things. And Solomon wanted Rehoboam to grow up as a wise young man. And any parent that's got any, got any salt, any parent that's got any wisdom in him, wants his son and his daughter to grow up with wisdom and to be a wise individual and make wise choices. They don't always do that. Rehoboam did not. If indeed this is the stated purpose of the book of Proverbs, then why, pray tell, don't more Christians live wisely? I guess they don't know it's in here. And by the way, notice where we are in Proverbs chapter 1. It's stated at the beginning. You don't even have to dig through the book to find the purpose. It's found in the first few verses of the chapter. And that was only through verse 6 of chapter 1. Why are we making foolish decisions and going so far astray? I guess we just don't know what the Bible says. Number five, it's dangerous to disregard God's wisdom. Let's say it again. It is dangerous to disregard God's wisdom. Look what it says in chapter one, beginning in verse 23. Turn you at my reproof. That's interesting. It says wisdom ought to change you. Proverbs ought to change the direction of your life. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Stop right there. That's a picture phrase in the Bible. That wisdom stands in the middle of the road with his hands up in the air waving you down. Many years ago, we were traveling from Adrian, Michigan to Indianapolis, Indiana. And we got involved in a terrible ice storm that had absolutely covered the interstate. As we were driving along, and Jack was on a uh, monitor uh, uh, at that time, and we were driving down there, and we were getting low on gas, and we came up to this place, and a man is standing in the middle of the interstate, and he's waving both hands in the air to, that we're supposed to slow down and stop. It was literally no exaggeration given, not making it up as I go. The road was a sheet of solid ice. And cars had already crashed. If I remember, there might have been 20 or 30, maybe even 40 cars involved in an accident. And we got stopped, but he was waving his arms. And uh, what if I would have said, I'm going to go ahead anyway. We're already late. My kid's on a monitor and I need gasoline. Uh-uh. If we would have kept going and disregarded his warning, we would have been involved in that car wreck. We found a way to get over the interstate, to go down into a small little town, and we're able to get some gasoline. But that's what the picture is drawing here. He says here, um, I will, um, he says, but ye have said it not. Well, I says, I stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not, my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For, they, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. That's wisdom talking. That's right. Verse 23 says that the purpose for the reproof is to turn us from foolishness to the Lord's wisdom. Verse 24 says that some people refuse God's wisdom. And refuse here means literally your mind is already made up. In other words, the decision, I'm not listening to you. You see, it was one of those words that gives us that picture. Verse 24 says that some will not regard God's wisdom. And to not regard means that you'll not even listen to it. The entire phrase draws a picture for us. Wisdom stands in that road and waves its arms. Verse 25 says that some will dismiss God's wisdom. They'll set it at naught, which means they'll loose it from them and dismiss it out of their lives. And this person, having had wise counsel and opportunity to know God's wisdom, decides just he just no longer wants it. 
you see. That's why a lot of people quit church, and it's not because of the personality of the preacher or the personality of the assistant or the personality of the sound man or the personality of the ushers or the personality of their Sunday school teacher or anything else. They would just don't want to hear it anymore, you see, and that's incredible. Verses 25 and 30 say that some reject God's wisdom. It says, would none of my proof, and it means that with the facts placed in front of them, this man's still not going to be proved wrong. It's like the lady that I've uh, mentioned to you many times, the very first minute, she said, I don't care what the Bible says. I know what happened to me. When anybody says they don't care what the Bible says, that's a dangerous position to be in. Verse 29 says there are even some who have no respect for God's wisdom. That little word hate in verse uh, 29, it means to be held in a low esteem and no longer respected. You see, it is not considered as something that's necessary. Some will say, for example, this man thinks that he does not need church, a church family, or a pastor. He has set his own authority above God's and justified it, thus he chooses something else. Yeah, that's a, that's a very accurate description of how people, you know, uh, it's like this movement today that simply says that we don't need church, we are the church. That's an amazing statement that's said by some very, I think, sincere, but very ignorant people. God shed his own blood for the church. Call it what you want to. Are you listening to what I'm saying? The Bible says that it's important and Jesus gave his life. Are you hearing me? But yet there are those to say, we don't need the church. We are the church. Go out and be the church. Well, I'm not at all uh, upset with somebody being the church, but you're not supposed to forsake the assembling either as the manner of some is and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and verse 25, you can't disregard those verses just because you quote, are the church. And verse 30 tells of the man who despises God's wisdom and reproof, and despising that wisdom and that reproof is displayed by angry words and a scorner's attitude. For example, who do you think you are? Who made you the Holy Spirit in my life? Who made you the judge, jury, and executioner of righteousness in my life? That's the attitude that comes when somebody has a scorner's attitude. And what does the Bible tell us about scorners in Psalm 1? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor what? Sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And many believers today, at a disregard for God's wisdom, have become scorners of those who regard God's wisdom. Number six, and I'll be done. What is the end result of disregarding God's wisdom? Is there an end result? God didn't just give us a warning. Now he tells us the end of it. Chapter 1, verses 26 through 32. He says, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your, des and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, uh, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. And for the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Wow. You see, when you start rejecting God's wisdom, there is an end result. And those who reject God's wisdom will say things like, everything's okay so far, on the way down. And everything probably is, at that moment, okay, as they're on their way down. But can I put it in the Tennessean vernacular? They ain't hit bottom yet. And that stop at the bottom is a killer. Verse 26 says, the result is that wisdom will laugh at you, not with you. Verse 26 says, wisdom will mock at you, and it will let you hear the words of your own wisdom and know the foolishness of it. Verse 28 says, wisdom will not answer you. God refuses to grant wisdom to an unrepentant scorner. That's sad. 
Well, I called out to God and he didn't answer me. Oh, wait a minute. What was, the, what was their preceding actions that brought that? The, the, you can only reject it so many times to where God says, all right, you're not going to get any. And that's exactly what he's saying here. Uh, the, James 1.5 does say that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. Yeah, you ask, but we're talking here about an individual who sincerely seeks the wisdom of God and has not lived in total rejection. Verse 28 says, wisdom will not come to the rescue. Sorry, I got other things to do, says wisdom. Wisdom will not be willfully disregarded and run to your aid without a real change in your heart. And then verses 31 and 32, it's the final result is simply this, self-destruction. And that's when somebody looks at their life after a life of failure and they say, how did I get here? I don't know how I got here. What happened in my life? I remember how this used to be. And things were so good and things were so right and things were so happy. And now look at me. How did I get here? That's the end result here, you see. But a repentant scorner can find the wisdom of God. Now, we've looked at the foundational truths of Proverbs, and I wonder how many of us have been reminded, maybe even convicted, concerning a blatant disregard for the wisdom of God. You see, these lessons that we've been doing on Wednesday nights for these past 25 weeks, there's a reason for them. Everything from being successful to uh, how you treat other people and all the 25 different lessons so far. And we're not done yet. We're, we're coming close to the end of this study. But to disregard these things is to be a dangerous thing because, you know, these are not just Old Testament rules. These are things here that God says you need these, you see. And of course we do. Do you have a governor in your life? The governor that God has given us, believe it or not, is the book of Proverbs and other places we could go. But proverb means a governor. And without it, you just might burn up in your life because that's what a governor does. It keeps you from going nuts and burning up and losing it. Oh, pastor, I couldn't help it. I just lost it. I lost control. Okay, what happened to the governor? Maybe you did what my brother did. <laughs> he'd take a pair of pliers and break that governor off of that, off of that uh, wire. And he could open it wide open. And he could go as fast as that little Tecumseh engine could take him, that's for sure. So anyway, that's my study for tonight. All this to tell us that, and I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight. I know that. I'm talking to a great church family. I understand that. You all are mature in so many ways. And I love, I love you, and I, I love this church so much. This was not a rebuke to any of you, unless it needed to be. What it was was that we might understand why God has given us the book of Proverbs. And as we saw tonight, there's a number of points that he gave, that he gave us just in the first chapter of Proverbs. I'm not talking about a Bible study through the entire Bible. I'm talking about a one chapter, simple Bible study of why God gave it to us. And there's more wisdom in chapter one than you'll find in almost any book on a shelf anywhere you go. It's all right there. So that's what I had to say tonight. Let's all stand for a closing word of prayer. And I just.